Hey, McNutt here. I'm about to tell you how the American West was actually won. And I'm pretty sure you've never heard this before, but won from what or from whom was the West won? Pretty important question, don't you think? When the conversation about how the West was won comes up, it's generally accepted that the time frame was within the cowboy era. That means we're talking from the end of the Civil War in 1865 and going to about 1895. For many people, Indians, side note, there were no Indians, many people consider Native Americans are the assumed obstacles to controlling the West. Kind of, but just barely. The first people had lived in the Americas for possibly up to 20,000 years, so their claim was pretty solid. However, through government lies, broken treaties, the intentional spreading of disease, and the horrors of Christianity, the Native Americans were not the main issue during the time we call the Wild West. Sure, a couple of treaties were still in place, but for the most part, the first people had been forced into what is today known as Oklahoma. The winning of the West was largely about conquering criminals in a lawless region that centered around the current day city of Fort Smith. But don't be disappointed. This story is just as intriguing as any Western you've ever seen with a wagon load of cowboys and wily, dangerous desperados like the Dolan Dalton gang, the Rufus Butt gang, the Cook gang, Cherokee Bill, Jim Killer Miller, and the bandit queen, Belle Starr, to name a very few. The story of how the American West was won, to the best of my knowledge, has never really been told via our collection of screens. Sure, Hollywood has made many attempts and, and even used some tasty nuggets of actual history to tell a number of compelling stories about this uniquely American era. Feel your hand, you son of a bitch! Granted, winning the American West is a complicated saga that will be different depending upon who's telling it. After all, people have agendas and history is often manipulated for one narrative or another. To be clear, and this must be said, the backdrop of Europeans moving west is America's version of colonialism as the US government displaced and stole the land that Native Americans had lived on for up to 20,000 years. Just like the English, et cetera, et cetera, were doing across Africa and other places on this itty bitty planet. Maybe it was inevitable, but the cruelty, manipulation, and genocidal attempts should never be minimized and can never, ever be justified. What happened to the Native Americans and others was and continues to be as evil and deceitful as any human effort in history. I'll do my best to stay as true as possible, but there may be accidental wanderings across that line of accuracy because one, it's a freaking huge, long, complicated story that I can't possibly get into the kind of detail the story deserves here. And two, it's almost impossible to fact check many of the incredible happenings I'm about to share. Rest assured, this story is ripe with villains, heroes, villains that became heroes and heroes that became villains and some badass lawman that Hollywood, for some strange reason, has yet to shine a light on, but has stolen from over and over. Let's calibrate. When you think of the Wild West, you probably think of movies like The Outlaw Josie Wales. Oh, you're gonna pull those pistols and whistle Dixie. Tombstone. I'm your Huckleberry. That's just my game. Silverado. Hey! Or The Long Riders. Those are the all-time best Westerns. If you disagree and have another Western that you think belongs on the list, well, first, you're wrong. And second, please leave a comment down below because I'm curious what you think could replace one of these absolute classics. But you're here for a true story, so we have to start with this guy to understand what was going on just after the Civil War. Fort Smith was a small border town that sat on the edge of Indian territory. That's the official name. Hard to believe that no one had a better grasp of geography that could straighten out this little quirk of Native Americans versus Indian for the first couple of hundred years on the continent. And yet, Indian territory was on official documents. Still is today. Just ask the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Fort Smith sat on the east side of the Arkansas River, and on the western side was this Indian territory, also known as Rustler's Roost. 
not because they had hyper-aggressive chickens, but because the U.S. lawmen had no jurisdiction there. Someone could commit a crime, bolt over the border, and as long as they didn't get caught by Native American law enforcement, gotta put these handcuffs on you. They were relatively safe. However, Native American law enforcement had no jurisdiction over white people. Super handy for some folks, right? So yes, there were a lot of criminals, gangs, and critical to our story, impressively corrupt lawmen. Back to this guy. Oh, and this guy. Uh, this is U.S. Marshal Logan Root, and that one is Judge of the Western District of Arkansas, William Story. These two were breathtakingly corrupt. At the time, the U.S. government would essentially reimburse efforts of law enforcement and had a system of pay based on warrants served, miles traveled, arrests made, etc., etc. It didn't take long for these guys to realize how easily this system could be manipulated. In 1869, they submitted... In 1869, they submitted expenditures of $56,000, but quickly realized that no one seemed to be checking their homework. So three short years later, expenditures climbed to over $400,000. That's roughly $6 million today. Guess what? That did kickstart an investigation. At the same time, fat cats in Washington, D.C. were already throwing their lustful, greedy eyes towards Indian territory, land that had just been given to the Native Americans. You see, there were speculators, investors, developers, railroad companies, churches, many powerful people and wealthy companies. Today, we know them by their representatives, lobbyists. They were ready to go take the last of the land from the first people. But there was just one problem. It was too damn dangerous. Diane ain't much of a living boy. There were so many violent gangs of murderers, rapists, thieves. The West was lost and needed a good winning. The entire region was simply too risky to make any investment of any kind. And that had to change. It was time for a hero. President Grant was knee deep in post-Civil War turmoil, including massive debt, and a nation that had been punching itself in the face for the last four years. He turned to a young former congressman, Isaac C. Parker, an intelligent, strong-minded man who seemed to be above corruption to clean up the western edge of civilization. President Grant wanted this to happen quickly, so Judge Parker was given absolute power over 70,000 square miles that stretched from Fort Smith, Arkansas to Colorado. The only appeal to his decisions could come from the President of the United States. Judge Isaac C. Parker is a man you've likely never heard of, and he's ground zero for how the story of the American West was won. Parker's boots first hit Fort Smith dirt in 1875, and he did not come to play. One of the first moves was to cleanse the corrupt U.S. Marshal system and bring in men that he could trust. This was a supersized, ballsy move in a time when people would shoot you for standing too close or farting indoors. To create a civil, safe society, people had to trust authorities, the legal system, and the men that operated and enforced that system. On May 10th, barely over a week since his arrival in Fort Smith, Parker opened his first term of court. By September 3rd, eight men were sentenced to be hanged. Before that date arrived, one of the men tried to escape and was shot dead by George Maladon, the official hangman. Here's a little DIY tip from Mr. Maladon. If you're going to be a top-rated hangman on Fiverr, the key is a big knot. Listen, you're not trying to suffocate the felon. That's cruel. A big knot ensures the neck breaks and death is instant. Now you know. One of the remaining seven men to be hanged was lucky enough to get a presidential pardon. More on that later. The other six men convicted of murder were hanged simultaneously on a permanent gallow built to accommodate six convicts at a time. Parker was a young man in a hurry. People came from as far as 50 miles to watch the first of many executions, so word spread quickly that things were changing. I'm curious, what kind of a man do you think Parker was? Cruel, righteous, power hungry? Ponder that as we move forward. Judge Parker now had the attention of the entire region. After getting rid of any corrupt lawmen, he appointed 200 deputy marshals. He sent these deputies into the comically misnamed Indian Territory to bring these men of blood to justice. Those chosen to ride for Parker became legends. Seriously, we're talking Earth's Mightiest Heroes first edition. Giants like Bass Reeves, Frank Eaton, the original Pistol Pete, whose story is 
absolutely bonkers, to name a few. During the 21 years of Parker's administration, somewhere between 65 and 100 of these marshals were killed in the line of duty. In fact, there has never been a more dangerous assignment in the history of U.S. Marshals. If you like Westerns, please leave a comment and I'll do a deeper dive into some of these Wild West legends in the future. Trust me, these stories are simply remarkable. For today, I'm going to focus on the three guardsmen, Heck Thomas, Bill Tillman, and Chris Madsen. These men are why Chuck Norris used to have his mom check under the bed before going to sleep. They literally scared the hell out of men that scared the hell out of other men. Many criminals simply left the region if they got word that the three guardsmen were on their trail. The choice was retire and run forever or die. It's difficult to separate the three guardsmen because they share similar traits of unflinching bravery and the determined pursuit of the fast zombies in World War Z. They simply wouldn't stop. That's Heck Thomas, I know. He looks like he's about to offer you some sweet tea and ginger snaps. How terrifying was it to be pursued by Heck Thomas? For starters, he once made an onion cry. Heck Thomas didn't sleep, he just waited. Heck Thomas once killed two stones with one bird. Emmett Dalton of the previously mentioned Dolan Dalton gang admitted that when they got word Heck Thomas was on their trail, they decided to rob two banks in one day so that they could get the hell out of the area and lay low for a while. Put a pin in that. Infamous gang leader Bill Dolan, who escaped jail, was hunted down and killed by Thomas in a typical Wild West shootout. Chris Matson, whom you've also likely never heard of, came to the U.S. from Denmark. He had a long military career prior to serving as a deputy U.S. Marshal under Judge Parker. He served 15 years in the cavalry and fought in the Franco-Prussian War. He was the guide for President Chester A. Arthur's tour of Yellowstone. He was also a rough rider with Teddy Roosevelt. Later in life, he tried to enlist in the military for World War I, but was rejected because he was 60 years old. So yeah, lifelong badass. Matson would spend months tracking deadly criminals. Perhaps his most well-known incident, and there were many, was the Battle of Ingalls. Matson and other lawmen had tracked the Dolan Dalton gang to this tiny community and a massive gunfight broke out. Matson led the charge with his typical fearless action in the face of danger. This battle dealt a decisive blow to the notorious gang. The third guardsman is Bill Tillman. Appropriately, Bill Tillman was born on the 4th of July in 1854. Tillman had served as a sheriff in Dodge City, Kansas, where he worked and became friends with Wyatt Earp and Bat Masterson. Masterson once said of Tillman, of all the peace officers I have ever known, Bill Tillman is the finest and most capable that has ever strapped on a six-shooter. Tillman was asked by Teddy Roosevelt how he remained so calm during the gunfights. Tillman replied, a man who knows he's right always has the advantage over a man who knows he's wrong. Noted. Perhaps that mindset allowed him to remain calm one day while he was crossing the street and heard his name called out by the brother of a man Tillman had recently killed in a gunfight. The angry brother was hell-bent on revenge as he pointed his gun at Tillman's back. The last thing that went through the revenge-seeking brother's mind was Tillman's bullet as the deputy U.S. Marshal spun and fired before the ill-planned retribution was complete. An interesting side note, Cattle Ann and Little Bridges, those are actual nicknames, were also captured by Tillman. These two teenage girls often served as lookouts and helped the gang evade authorities as they moved from town to town. Diane Lane and Amanda Plummer played these outlaws in the 1981 movie Cattle Ann and Little Bridges, with Burt Lancaster playing Bill Dolan. Bill Tillman was such a force that if you were to do a movie about him, only he could play himself. On the chance that he was not available, you'd have to get a top shelf Western star, like let's say Sam Elliott to play Bill Tillman. In fact, and this nearly split my skull open, Bill Tillman did play Bill Tillman in a movie directed by Bill Tillman. It was called A Bank Robbery. And decades after his death, Sam Elliott did indeed play the role of Bill Tillman in You Know My Name. Tillman was a lawman right up to his dying day. On November 1st, 1924, he approached a drunken prohibition officer. Yeah, you heard that right. A corrupt prohibition officer was publicly drunk and approached by 70-year-old Tillman, who was serving as the chief of police in Cromwell, Oklahoma. After a brief scuffle, Wiley Lynn shot Tillman, who died shortly after. Somehow, Lynn was acquitted of murder. A few days later, the town burned to the ground. There are rumors 
unsubstantiated, that guardsman Chris Madsen burned the city to the ground in retribution for his friend and colleague. The three guardsmen arrested over 300 desperados and killed many less fortunate criminals. In fact, one could make the argument that their reputation alone wiped out the Dalton gang during a botched double bank robbery mentioned earlier. None of the guardsmen were even there. However, the gang was attempting to take out two banks on the same day to build a quick nest egg and lay low for a while, hoping to evade the dogged pursuit of the holy trinity of lawmen. They botched the attempt in their fundraising rush, and the entire town took action, killing most of the bandits. This event was the inspiration for a remarkable scene in the excellent western, The Long Riders. Again, there are so many lawmen like the guardsmen, and I would love to dive deeper into some of them if you're interested. However, the driving question I'm trying to answer is, how was the West won? Let's go back to Judge Parker, who became known as the hanging judge and wholly feared during his reign by those who violated the law. Parker hanged 79 men. He had no sympathy for murderers or rapists, and his unflinching reputation and sterling collection of U.S. Deputy Marshals quickly restored law and order to a violent region. But there was one major flaw with Parker. In fact, it was such an unforgivable trait that politicians back in the East were forced to take action. You see, the D.C. power brokers wanted Native American land. However, the land was protected by the law. Parker followed the law with faith and honor. He wouldn't allow the Native Americans to be manipulated. Incredibly, Parker went to address Congress on the matter. Parker said, now, what is the solution of this problem of advancing civilization? In my judgment, it is to give them, the Indians, protection. Give them security. Give them that administration of the law of the United States. They are working out their own destination and they are on the road to a final solution of the problem. Where instead of having territorial government, it will be statehood of the five tribes. They will come under the flag as a state in this nation. They are not ready for it, but they are working toward it. They have every element which is involved in civilization, and they are using those elements from the neighbors and the friends of the good people of the surrounding states. They have the confidence and the respect of the people, and I say, let them alone. Now, I'm certain that the congressman stood and applauded and then immediately started whispering that Parker had to go. So a smear campaign was started post haste. The rumor was that Parker had become a power hungry madman who was out of control and must be stopped. Parker was the only man standing between the profiteers and the first people whom Parker admired deeply. For Parker's first 14 years, he operated with near supreme power. That ended in 1889. Guess what else happened in 1889? The land rush of Oklahoma, the first of seven. It was the end of the end for Indian Territory. So what was Parker really like? Well, if you were a murderer or a rapist, you'll have a pretty different opinion. However, he was adored by citizens. He helped start the first hospital in Fort Smith and was instrumental in starting the first library. Believe it or not, the hanging judge wasn't even a fan of the death penalty, but that was the law and Parker's job was to uphold the law. Earlier, I mentioned that Parker could only be overruled by a president. Well, that did happen. A man was sentenced to be hanged, but an appeal was made to the president by Parker himself. You see, he had upheld the law, but didn't think the application was correct in this certain case. Parker was also known to send lesser criminals to trade school, many of whom returned to Fort Smith later to thank Parker for his guidance. So how was the West won? By appointing a man beyond corruption to head an elite group of fearless men to bring law and order to one of the most dangerous regions the U.S. has ever known. And more importantly, to get rid of that man beyond corruption and replace him with someone pre-corrupted to save time and pass laws that were previously illegal. The historical lesson here is clear. If you want a small group of men to control an entire nation, all you have to do is remove the honorable judges and replace them with corrupt puppets willing to bend, stretch, twist, stomp, and tenderize the life out of the law until it can be molded to fit the needs of the wealthy few. It's really that simple. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this kind of content, please subscribe. Make that out.